Now, obvious. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Obviously, why we're learning this is the connection to Avram and Yitzchak, Abraham and Isaac, who are the subject matters, who are the protagonists of these Torah portions. Because, so let's begin. This is chapter two of Hilchot Bet Abchira, which is which are the laws of the Bet Hamikdash, and chapter two begins as follows: the altar, the mizbeach is to be placed in a very precise location which may never be changed. The size of the, the temple constantly expanded, but the location of the critical components remained forever unchanged. As we just read, the altar, the Mizbeach, we're talking about the outer altar, there were two, the inner one, the gold, small golden one for the offering of incense, we don't speak of that one, we're talking about the main altar in the courtyard in the priestly courts out of the temple. So its location is precise. As it is written, this is the altar for the burnt offerings of Israel. And that word, this, means this place and no other. Why is it so special? So the Rambam Maimonides goes on to explain why this location is so critical and cannot be deviated from. And that is because Isaac was prepared to be sacrificed on the temple's future site. As it is said, which we just read, we got which we're going to read in this week's parsha. rather, God says to Avraham, go to the land of Moriah. And that Moriah, Har HaMariah, uh, that mountain, that's the site of the future Bet HaMikdosh. And in Chronicles 2, it says, then Solomon began to build the house of God in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David, his father, in the place that David had prepared, in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Yevusite, from whom Jacob, uh, uh, David had purchased um, that location to build the temple by his son, King Solomon. Turn the page. So, it's going? Yeah. So, Avram goes to sacrifice his son. Hey, via, turn the page. Lakach. Because that specific location is the location that represents the ultimate sacrifice that a human being can do. So therefore, Rakach, it brought to that, that this place should therefore be designated. To man offering offerings. They might be thinking, well, it's true that Avram sacrificed himself, but Yitzchak equally uh, is offering himself there. He's allowing himself to be sacrificed, but we can all appreciate his parents. Which one is a greater sacrifice? To bring your son than to bring yourself. So of the two, yes, Yitzchak is, and we're not surprised because that's what he is. He's all about sacrifice. He's all about gevura, fire, from below to above. But still at the end, it's Avram sacrifice that's greater because he's offering his child, and especially the tender, loving person that Avram was. In brackets, Omnom Gam Yitzchak Hiskim Lim Sorat Nafshot True. Yitzchak agreed and didn't protest. So that's tremendous sacrifice on his behalf. Aval, however, Hakavata Ben, offering a child, Himisirut Nefesh Gdola Yoter, is greater, Kiyodua, as it's known. And footnote 121, this is a quote from one of the Alt Rebbe's discourses, and he says, quote, Vulachen, at the end of the line there where the quotations begin. The Al-Tab explains, why is this test only always associated with Abraham? Avram, why isn't it associated with Yitzchak? He's ready to die. Answer, we just gave the answer. Because, that for Avram to give his own life up, that's easy. That was easy for him to sacrifice himself. Avram, that is ready to offer his child, that's true sacrifice. That's why we associate this with him. So, conclusion. The fact that the, that the, the altar, the, again, there's two components to the Bet HaMikdash. One is man to God, that's the altar. God to man is the general Mikdash. What, are we, what is, the, in the law number two, what does the Rambam associate with? The Mizbeach with, of the two, which one? Avraham, because he is the one even though Yitzchak is offering Yitzchak, but it's Avraham that's really the supreme sacrifice here. The ill, on the other hand, second paragraph now, Kuf Tzadik Ches, Binyan HaMikdash, when he speaks about what? The general holiness of the place, which is conferred by whom? 
by God, yeah, in, the, in law number one that we just read of chapter two, Maskir Arambam Davket Yitzchak. Who does he invoke? Yitzchak. And he invokes Yitzchak not in connection with the altar, because that's man to God, but with the Mikdash in general, because that's God to man. Why? Sheken, he is, he is the symbol of holiness. Why? Ha'uvda the fact. Sheyitzchak nekad al mizbeach. He was offered on the altar v'nit kadesh b'kdushat olah. He became sanctified thereafter with the sanctity of a what, uh, uh, a korban olah, which is the highest order of offerings. Yitzchak becomes a holy thereafter, a holy being conferred by heaven because of Avraham's offering. It's God's response, the sanctification of Yitzchak. So Yitzchak embodies the holiness conferred from above. Footnote 122, Rashi points out, Yitkadesh, it's quoting from next week's uh, Pasha Toldot, a few weeks from now, 122, Yitkadesh Bahar Ham, it's explaining there why Yitzchak could never leave Israel. You're going to say that, because he became like an offering, and an offering you know that to bring out of the holy temple or out of Jerusalem. So he, Nitkadesh Bahara Moriah, Rashi tells us that moment on Mount Moriah, from that moment he became sanctified, Liot Olat Mima, he was to become designated as a perfect offering to God. Now that's something that heaven designates, that's God's response to the willingness to sacrifice. So he, Yitzhak, is the symbol of what? Of the sanctity conferred by heaven, and Avram here is the symbol of man's offering to God. So let's conclude that that point. Hey, so, so you, here, basically, it's the reverse of what we usually learn. I, yeah, I think you missed the beginning of the class because it's here where Avram goes against his nature. Right. Yeah, right. correct. I'm just saying that if you, you don't focus here on a Yitzhak, a Yitzhak's avoida, focus on the result of it. What's yeah was done to God's him? God's response to his yeah. avoida. And likewise, Avram is usually Chesed, but here he did the ultimate Gevura act. Right. Chesed is usually this way, from above to below. Here it's from below to above. So Vielakach Shema Komze. So uh, Yitzchak's status that's conferred upon him that brought we're reading down the Rambam that brought Shemakom Zeh this place that altar Yimakom HaKav uh, I'm sorry the Beit HaMikdash Yimakom HaKavua will be the permanent place Lashcha'at Ashchina for the the Divine Presence residing with the Giloy and the revelation of Tushato Shel HaKadosh Baruch God's holiness. Now, footnote 123 is fascinating. We'll see how precise the, the wording of the Rambam is. Can you see it? It's in small print. It's not that small. No, you're on the wrong page. It's 123. No. Page 120, uh, footnote 123. The Fiyam in light of the above, we can explain another nuance, another nuance in the words of the Rambam. Now, what's the nuance? The first subject matter, namely, when talking about the holiness of the temple in general. Now, I want you, let's play a little game here and you find the difference. I want you to look at the English text. Ah. The English does not give it to you. Well, he failed us, the translation. Yeah. But in the Hebrew, I want you to notice, if you read the Hebrew, look the way it describes Yitzchak. How is Yitzchak described in law number one? Just how, he, how is he identified? Yitzchak what? You don't have it? There's ten, there's, there's right over there. Huh? Yitzchak Avinu. Turn the page. How is Avram described? Nothing. Second no, line there. No, just Avro. It doesn't yet. So why is that? This is a question only the red would ask and answer. Comes to Yitzchak, Yitzchak our father. Comes to Avro, Avro. Why doesn't he say our father Avro? Avro have been there too. Or, or say neither. Say Yitzchak then Avro here. In fact, the translator dropped the word our father. It doesn't say Isaac our father, because it's like, why say it? 
But in light of the above, we're going to have the answer. That's how precise the Rambam is. It's incredible. Let's see the text inside. What are you saying? But About what? So it makes the question stronger. No, it also both. Yitzhak Avinu. But the truth is, Avrom Avinu more, if anything. So it makes the question stronger. If anything, it's Avrom Avinu and Yitzhak. He it's Yitzhak Avinu and Avrom without Avinu. What's going on? Again, such a nuance that the translator didn't even bother with. So hang on, this is the this is the halakha. This is not the Rambam. Okay. This is the Rambam. This is the Rambam. Oh, this is the Rambam. I'm sorry, you're right. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to explain this nuance, which points to a, the the incredible precision of Torah in the, the Rambam's words. Let's see the text. So again, when it comes to the Mikdash, he says, and I, and he says in italics there for us. And the site of the future temple, our father Yitzchak was bound. But in the second halacha, where he zeroes in on the precision of the Mizbech, the altar, Kasav, what does he write? That's the place where Avraham built the altar, the place where the future altar will stand. What does he say, Avinu? Veloy's kish Avram Avram Avinu. He doesn't say Avram is our father. Did you close the door? Answer. Hashraat Hashchina. Shebana bo Avraham. I'm sorry. Hashraat Hashchina be Mikdash. Answer. Because the revelation of the divine presence in the temple, shayechet dafke la Am Yisrael. That relates to who? Only the Jewish people. The holiness of the temple, listen carefully, is associated with the Jewish people exclusively. As it says, you'll see, see practically, what the, practically what this means. God says, mikdash, Make for me a temple. This is in Pasha Truman. I will dwell where? In, there. in you specifically. It didn't say in the world. It will manifest, you know. Therefore, also in the world, but it's a primary place for the Jewish people. And moreover, the halacha is, who can build the temple? Only a Jew. Lo lachem, velanu, it's not for you, but velanu live not beta elokeinu. This is, when actually built it in, in the book of Ezra, when he describes the building, so King Solomon would not take any uh, help from the actual building, the actual construction of anybody that was not Jewish, this is our, our building. As in Brachti tells us, as explained in Halacha, see these and these sources. Therefore, for the being Yan Zeh, when they're talking about the holy temple, he how does he describe Yitzchak as what? Our father, because that's the Jewish, our father, the Jewish people, uniquely, Yes, Makom, let's say, and that's why the Rambam points out, She Yitzchak who Avinu, Yitzchak is our father to underscore what? Of the father of who? La'am Yisrael, the Jewish people, as opposed to a universal uh, association. However, fascinatingly, the altar, when identifying the precise location of the altar, and he says Avram built the Mizbech, then to offer Yitzchak, does he describe Avram as Avram Avinu? No, why? The altar not. Implying a universality to the altar. Let's see. Avodat akad but not the mizbech lu magzot. On the other hand, bringing sacrifices on the altar, shayechet gamblu mot awalam. That is applicable even to the nations of the world. A non Jew may bring an offering. Shadigam heim nodrim nedarim redavot ki Israel. Like a Jew, they may also bring free will, uh, no, ob no obligation, but they can make a vow or uh, give a gift and bring an offering in the temple, and that happened uh, many times. So when speaking about the altar, he does not underscore Avraham Avinu, because the altar, in fact, is universal, and Avraham is the founder of all the nations. Actually, as the Rambam himself describes, as we just read in continuing law number two, what does he say? Who brought offerings there? 
Noach also offered there. Noach wasn't Jewish. Cain and Hevel. Cain and Abel weren't Jewish. Vadam Erishon and Adam. Sheinom Shayachim La'am Yisrael. They were not Jewish. They're universal. So there's a consistent association with the universality, with the place of the Mizbeach, which is why he drops Avinu, because now the Mizbeach is open to all. Now, there adds another nuance. Just go back to the second halacha, page 30. Here, how does he begin? How does he begin describing? And I want you to pick up it and give me and say, aha, an epiphany moment here. How does the Rambam begin describing the place of the Mizbeach? Yeah, he could have said it's accepted. Mesorah. Mesorah means a tradition passed down. And when you say Mesorah, it always means from Sinai, it's a Jewish tradition. But he adds the, he adds the words, Biyad HaKol, again to make universal. The non-Jews who, who want to be aware, they know, and they have an association with what? With this place of the altar. Adam, Cain, Abel, Noah, and therefore the altar remains eternally a place where all peoples can bring their sacrifice. Whereas the general home, it's a Jewish home, which the non-Jew is invited to bring his offering, if he so desires. So the Rambam begins with, not only it's a tradition, a Mesorah, but it's a universally accepted tradition. Again, to point to the fact that the altar is a place where all people may bring their offerings. That's the square brackets. Let you see it inside the bottom of the page. Beautiful, no? And we could suggest that this is Rambam's intent when he says it's a tradition universal in the hands literally of everyone. He wants to open this up. It's not the usual Mesorah. When you say Mesorah, tradition, we mean Sinai, Jewish. No. This is not only a Jewish tradition. This is something that exists universally. Because it's, it's applicable to them. For a non-Jew may bring, an old, uh, bring offerings, and they will, in the future temple. The English, the English version here is not right. It sounds like no, it says Noah built an altar on that location when he left the ark. That's correct. So the ark is there. It sounds like the ark was there. It, the ark was supposed to be in Turkey. Okay, there's other questions. Also, it's as I said at the end, it's true. The translation is absolutely correct, but it's a question on the on the, on the text. Likewise, they said, it says the man was created from the place to find atonement. Man was created in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is not Jerusalem. So these are, the earth was taken from there. Whatever, there were many answers to it. I think the commentary probably here addresses it as well. I think we had, we had a sheer on it. The commentaries address. Okay. Now let's continue our text. When did the nations bring on Sukkot? Pardon? When did the nations bring on the Count Sukkot? We brought on we behalf brought of the, the nations. On their behalf. On their behalf. But didn't they make, didn't, no, didn't the, the nations come to Jerusalem as well to give gifts or something like that? This, you're quoting, you're referring to in the Vizota Bracha, at the end of the last parasha, it makes reference that the nations of the world would come and they would come to uh, to do business. And they say, we came so far, let's go and see what... Uh, what is the what's what who are these people all about? They'll come to Jerusalem and they would see what's going on, they would convert. That's what you're referring to. Oh. Um, there's no reference there specifically about them bringing offerings, but the fact is, not in scripture, uh, there at least, but the fact is that they did, and the Mizbech is open to everyone. Okay, now continuing and concluding the point. So now back to the Hebrew text, Kuf Tzadik Ches. A new related point that's going to. It's going to uh, be understood in light of what we just explained. So what did we just explain? We explained, well, help me in the summary over here. The bottom line is, Avram and Yitzchak are both associated with the temple, but in different ways. Avram's association with the future temple is, what does he do? Which is, What's what's the universal component? Sacrifice. The sacrifice. Yitzchak's association, what he confers, sets in place, that later manifests is, that's a place of Sanctity, sanctity revelation from above. So there's these two aspects. Let's see now how that ties in with the whole story of the binding of Yitzchak, as the Rambam explains elsewhere in his Guide for the Perplexed. Let's see. So now after the star on page Kuf Tzadikhes, Biyuzeh, the explanation we just gave now, Ole Echad, 
literally ascends in one line, which means it's harmonious. In that, with that which the Rambam explains in one of his other works, guide for the perplexed. What does he say there? He talks there about the story of the binding of Isaac, and he says, Shetachlit nisayon akida, the objective of this test, who b'shnei inyanim merkaziyim, two central messages. She sparsimu al yadol, they became spread and known as a result of this event. Two important and critical components of our faith that became known as a result of that event. Number one, Lohadia Otano Gvul Avat Hashem. It publicized the limit of Avram's love, Biyirato, and his awe of God, Adhechan Himagas, the extreme level of love and awe of God that Avram was ready to do the absolutely impossible for him being to do, and yet he did so. That's number one. In other words, in summary, the limit or the no limit of man's degree of sacrifice. That's one thing. That's one message. Now another message that we learn from this story. Loadia Otanu, it's also telling us, why the prophets would truly believe that which comes to them in prophecy. In other words, it's a very big question that's raised by the commentaries. How was Avram so certain that God was speaking to him? He could have imagined it. Who knows? I mean, you're being told to do something that is contrary to morality and logic and so on, and all the reasons we learned yesterday why this was counterproductive and destructive. How did he know? So the fact that he did it means because when the prophet ex experiences prophecy, you know. And this story ascertains that because he was ready to do it, and then comes the revelation from above, don't do it, and God uh, intervenes, etc. But the critical part is, is really this, explains the Rambam. The fact that Avraham was ready to do it, this good man by all accounts, and ready to sacrifice his son, tells us that when the prophet experiences prophecy, which we don't, that they do, you know it's the truth. That's what the Rambam says, the two central messages of this story. One, how deep a person's sacrifice to God can be holding up the model of Avraham. And number two, that we should never doubt prophecy because in a prophet, which is someone who, there's, but there's many laws to this. Someone comes along and says, God spoke to me, we believe him. He has to have a track record of piety. But if he has a track record of scrupulous piety and he says so, God says, you can trust him. And the first one is Avraham. He acted upon this revelation. Now you could think about this is the very two things that we're talking about here. That the basic Mitesh embodies man's ultimate offering to God and God's revelation to man. God does reveal himself to man. It's the prophets that experience this revelation and we know for certain from this story that that is in fact true. Let's see it. Did God actually speak to him or he came to him in a dream? God already spoke to him. Spoke to him. The, there's different degrees of revelation. Moses had the highest, but the point is that he knew that it was God and not the figment of his imagination. And that's critical to our whole faith. The prophets speak. Well, why do you accept this? So Avram is the first and the most radical to demonstrate our faith in the words of the prophet, that in fact he speaks in God's name, which is a big part of our, of our the whole thing's based on it. The whole Judaism is based on it. Moses speaks, the prophets speak. So, Inyan Avat Hashem. So now we understand how this dovetails with our whole discussion. The Mikdash, the Temple, the Altar is an interplay of, the, of Avram and Yitzchak. In the story of the binding of Isaac, the two components, man to God, God to man. That's exactly what the Rambam is saying in the story of what this story is, is now establishing for future in the text. Inyan Avat Hashem Ve'irato. So the love of God and all of God that 
Abraham expressed, which the story of the Akedah uh, reveals in brackets, Avodat in italics, what? Adam. Adam, the, the degree, the heights that man can reach. So that brought what Avram, the supreme sacrifice, that led to that where what's the symbol of man's ultimate sacrifice? which is what offerings are all about. Where is it done? In the place where Avram is ready to offer Yitzchak, for there's no greater example of sacrifice than that. That's man to God. Final page, turn the page. Kuf Tzadik Tes. Ve'ilu, on the other hand, as the Rambam says, Pirsum ve'gilu ya'vada'ut, the revelation and the, pub, the publicizing of the certainty, she'be'maran of our faith in the certainty, that in the experience of prophecy, gilu'u me'it ha'kodesh baruchu, what's prophecy? Where God is speaking to man, he'vi le'kach, so this brought, and that took place there, because that's he's, he's doing God's bidding, that God revealed Himself there. Shegam the Dorot for future generations. That therefore effe- effected that Nasema comes in this place where Avram is sacrificing his son based on what? A revelation that comes from God, that God speaks to man. So this becomes therefore forever. Hamakoma Kavod established place. To God's revelation, in this place, God will reveal Himself in the future to His people, and that's so embodied in this story, where Avram acts and does the impossible, and that's only possible because he knows for certainty that it was God speaking, and our faith in that. So, Avram's role here is. There is the dual role here is the willingness to sacrifice is the Mizbeach part. The certainty that God is speaking is the other component of the Akedah, the revelation from above. So you see this beautiful, extraordinary connection here. That which Maimonides writes and guides for the perplexed. What did the, the offering of Isaac achieve? These two things, that's exactly what the Rambam is speaking about. The base of Mikdash is all about God to man and man to God. Clear? Specifically, God to man is Yitzchak. Man to God is Avraham. But in general, the story of the Akedah, as he explains elsewhere, establishes these two uh, messages for us. That we can offer and sacrifice to the degree that Avraham did and that God speaks to man. These are the two critical components of this story. And where is all that embodied? Physically in the temple. Temple in general and the place of the Mizbeach. Clear? Beautiful insight. Okay, friends. Okay, Shkoyach. Now, it stopped. No, it didn't stop.